Hello, and thank you for joining us today in our study of the book of Colossians. Today we're in Colossians chapter 4. This is the final chapter of the letter to the church at Colossae. And because of that, as you often have with Paul's letters, the fourth chapter is going to give a lot of final personal uh, mementos, a lot of different things that Paul is going to talk about that are of a more personal nature than a more technical nature. However, there are a few things at the start of chapter 4 that are worthy of our time and consideration, as well as seeing what Paul says about those who are working with him at the time. So let's examine this final chapter of the book of Colossians. Beginning in verse 1, we read, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, they have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea and those who are in Herapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, and the church that is in his house. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read from the epistle, or the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. As you look at Colossians chapter 4, there's several different layers of things that I want us to take a, a minute to consider, but they're going to fall into two distinct categories. The first one is found at the start of chapter 4, and I, I want you to notice first and foremost before we delve into the lessons that this is one of those occasions where sometimes the chapter and verse divisions don't always help, instead they hinder. Uh, in, in chapter 4, it begins with, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing you also have a master in heaven. That is not the start of a new discussion. That is actually the final statement of the previous discussion at the end of chapter 3, where he talks about the, the relationship and the, and the attributes that are supposed to reign in the relationships between husband and wife and parents and children and servants and masters. And so you have this final statement here in chapter 4, verse 1, which gets removed from the rest of the conversation in the way that most people view it. And yet it is a part of that previous conversation. So we always have to be careful when it comes to those chapter divisions that we don't move something out of the conversation that it's a part of in order to put it somewhere else when the text does not do that itself. But notice a couple of things beginning in verse 2. There, Paul is going to talk about the need to continue earnestly in prayer. And then he says in verse 5, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. 
walking in wisdom means the daily walk of your life, the daily way you live your life. Make sure you're making the right choices. Make sure you're doing the right thing. But he specifically talks about toward those who are outside, those who are outside the body of Christ, those who are not Christians. Be carefully attentive to the way that you interact with them. There are many people who have the mindset, unfortunately, that for those who are outside of Christ, for those who are not Christians, we can treat them any way we want to. We can look down upon them. We can act with them as though they are less than we are or they are unworthy or God doesn't love them or doesn't want them because they are not in Christ. When what Paul says here is exactly the opposite. Instead, he says, you walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time, making the best use of the time. Well, how does that in, occur? Notice what he says in verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Let your speech always be in a way that is gracious. Let your speech always be something that is valuable, something that is useful. Let it be seasoned with salt so that you may have the best impact that you can have on those you meet that are not in Christ. It is amazing how many times people who claim to be Christians act in a way that is angry and irresponsible and negligent when it comes to the way they treat others, but especially when it comes to the way they treat others who they do not perceive to be one of them. Paul says our mentality is to walk in wisdom, to, to be intelligent, to be thoughtful, to be smart about the way that we deal with every individual, that we are to continue earnestly in prayer, and, and that we are to be those who are vigilant in it with thanksgiving, he says, verse 2, that we're praying for our brethren, that we're helpful and that we're encouraging and strengthening to our brethren, but that to those on the outside, we are ones who are fully cognizant of the influence that we can have for good or for ill, and we strive to do everything we can to make that influence one that is positive, not negative. And so we have to be ones. If we are going to claim to be members of the body of Christ who walk in wisdom and who are thoughtful and who are purposeful, in the way that we interact with people and in the way that we deal with people on a day-to-day -day basis, that we are ones who do not come off as, as angry and as ones who are uh, mean-spirited and who are ugly, but rather that we have the reputation of being the kindest, most considerate, most caring individuals that people meet on a day-to-day -day basis. The second thing I want us to notice is Paul's conclusion, because he's going to write about all of his different companions and all of his friends and all of those that have been traveling and working with him during this time. And remember back to our introduction that at this time, Paul is in prison. Paul is under house arrest. He is waiting to stand before Caesar. He is not a free man. He does not have the freedom to be able to go anywhere he wants and to do whatever he wants but rather he still has around him all of these individuals that have been helpful to him, that have been beneficial to him. And he's going to break them down somewhat into two categories. You're going to have Tychicus and Onesimus and Aristarchus and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And these are going to be the ones that, according to verse 11, are those that work among him or those that have been working with him that are Jews. Now, Onesimus uh, may very well not be, but the interesting thing about it is you go to the book of Philemon and Onesimus is there going to be the topic of discussion for this letter to Philemon, who all indications are was a member of the church at Colossae. And so you have the mention of Onesimus here in the book of Colossians. You're also going to have him being the central topic of discussion in the book of Philemon. So to flesh that out a little bit more, I'd encourage you to go read Paul's letter to Philemon. But you have here these ones who are going to come, 
and they are going to make known uh, what's going on with Paul and the circumstances and to see how things are going in Colossae as well as Laodicea. But then you also have those who are the Gentile workers with Paul, those who are uh, from the Gentile regions. And those will include Epaphras in verse 12, as well as Luke the physician and Demas in verse 14. And both Luke and Demas are discussed in various other places. Yes, this is the Luke that writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And Demas is going to be one who travels with Paul extensively. And you actually read about Demas again over in the book of 2 Timothy under a very different circumstance a few years later. But there are several different individuals that are working with Paul, even though Paul is in prison, even though he is not a free man, he's also not alone. And that's one of the key things I want you to take from this section of chapter 4. There are people that are still working with him on a day-to-day -day basis. There are people that are still remaining there to encourage him and to strengthen him and to make sure that he is able to do what he continues to want and need to do while he is in this period of difficulty and turmoil. And so even with that, Paul was not left on his own. There were still those who were with him, who were helping him, and who were serving as his hands, and who were serving as his feet to send out messages. Notice that the last statement of the book is the salutation by my own hand which tells us that the likelihood is Paul did not actually put uh, pen to paper, as it were, or pen to scroll to write these particular letters. But instead, they would have been written, they would have been uh, inscribed by one of the others that were with him, and Paul would have been the one dictating the letters, and somebody else did the writing. Paul simply signed it at the end, showing that it was from his own hand. These are the things that I see in Colossians chapter 4, and I hope that they are things that are beneficial to you, and thank you so much for going through this study with us. Next time when we come back, we will begin to look at the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I hope that you'll come back and join us then. But until that time, have a great day.